fundamental concepts in copyright and in patent, um, which if you, I, I find that a lot of software people actually often know a lot about copyright and patent, but I might come at it a little bit from a different angle than you're used to hearing it, because I, I teach at a law school and I'll talk a little bit the way that lawyers talk about this stuff. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about first is what copyright protects or what copyright prevents you from copying, right? And this is a, this was a case that was decided locally that you may well be familiar with, right? This was Oracle versus Google. When, uh, when Google acquired Android and wanted to, was developing, further developing the Android system to put it on smartphones, they wanted to have third-party applications of course. So Google decided to have those done in Java and sought a license from Sun not to use the Java language. Right? Anybody can use the Java language. It's not copyrighted. But rather, if you're going to run Java on a phone, the, the phone has to have a program, the Java Virtual Machine. And that's copyrighted. And at that time, Sun had the copyright. And Sun and Google didn't arrive at a, an agreement to allow Google to license it the way that most people uh, that use Java uh, do. So Google decided rather to write its own Java virtual machine. And Google didn't copy the code from the Java virtual machine. Which they could have, you know, it's not hard to get even if you don't have a license because it's so widely distributed. What Google did copy were the declarations or the headers for each of the, 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 the methods, right, kind of analogous to functions in Python that you use in Java. So, for example, Juve, Google copied java.lang.math.max, which is just a little function in Java that will return you the maximum of a, of a set of numbers, right? But Google didn't copy Sun's code. Google wrote its own code, right? Which is probably pretty trivial. And Google did that for thousands of methods, right? It didn't copy the entire Java uh, all the Java APIs and all the Java classes and packages, but it copied all the ones that you'd reasonably expect if you're going to be developing an application for, for, a, for a phone. But Google wrote its own code. Uh, Java, well, Sun, successor, Oracle, who wasn't as friendly as Sun, uh, after they acquired Java, they sued Google for copyright infringement, for copying all those, you know, hundreds of declarations or headers. So that was the question. Are those, cop those uh, APIs, headers, are those protected by copyright? Which raises the question, well, why does copyright apply to software at all? Right? Copyright applies only to expressive creative works, right? Normally songs, films, music. Functional works can be protected, not by copyright, but by patent. I mean, software is, sounds like it's kind of functional, right? Uh, but Congress, in its wisdom, has included software within copyrightable works. Uh, in particular, copyright applies to software as a literary work, right? which is an unusual use of that word literary, right? If you go to a local university and you want to take a cl class in programming Python, you're not going to look in the English literature department. Or if, or if somebody ever gets a prize for, uh, for developing Python, they're not going to get the Nobel Prize for Literature, right? <coughs> Software is not usually thought of as literature. But in copyright law, it's a literary work, which has an important uh, consequence. The only thing that copyright protects is creative expression. Copyright doesn't protect functionality. So code, software code, is protected from copying only if you copy 
You're only pro prohibited from copying the expressive elements of copyright code, of software code. You can copy all the functional elements you want. But of course, that's a false dichotomy, right? If you've heard, if you've been going to talks today and, and, and yesterday, you've probably heard a lot of people talking about how to improve your coding. And they'll say, well, how to write more beautiful code or how to write, how to make your code more readable or how to make it, um, you know, how to make it fill up the page or the effect that indentation has. And those are all things that affect the aesthetic aspects of the code and the creative aspects of the code. But of course, they're all things that affect the way that the code functions. So copyright protection for software is premised, we see, on sort of a false dichotomy. Which brings us back to Java and Google. Well, did Google infringe? Well, in the US, it's a, a case law common law system. So the courts give us guidance on how to apply things, like how do you divide between the expressive elements of a work which are protected and the functional elements of a work which aren't. And this is the leading Supreme Court case on copyright protection for software. This, or this is the only one. And this is the most recent Supreme Court case on copyright protection for software. What, what year do you think this is from? Uh, that's right. Close, 1879. <laughs> um, that's a, and, but this is it, right? And I'm not kidding about that. If you want to figure out if something's protected by copyright or not, this 1879 Supreme Court case is the only Supreme Court case. There's lots of lower court cases. What happened in this one is it seldom invented a double entry accounting system, a system not protected. He wrote a book about it. The text, copyrighted literary work, protected. He also had forms in the book. So Baker copied the forms. Are those protected? or not? Are the forms expressive? Or are they functional? The Supreme Court figured, well, if you want to use the system, you got to use the forms. Therefore, they're not protected by copyright. And that's the case that, that guides all copyright law decisions. Uh, this is the other Supreme Court case on functionality versus expression. Here, this court said, well, a lamp base in the form of a dancing statuette you know, yes, it's functional because it's a lamp base, but it also has its aesthetic elements that are separable, right? You can copy the statuette aspect separately from the function of being a lamp base. So a dancing statuette is protected. So not protected, protected. Those are the only two Supreme Court cases on point. I'll give an example of some lower court cases that sort of help you apply this distinction. Tetris versus someone who cloned Tetris. That's infringement because they copied too closely. The way the Tetris works isn't protected by copyright, but they also protected the aesthetic elements, right? The shading, the use of unitary colors, and then if we, if we made it run, even the way that they fall. So the court held that's copying not just uh, function, but also expression. This one is kind of off point, but because this is PyCon, I thought I should throw this in. Uh, from last year, somebody wrote Pi Symphony. They, they just simply assigned a note to each number. So three, one, four, one, five, da na na. Uh, later on, somebody else wrote how, what Pi sounds like. So the author of Pi Symphony thought that he'd been copied and sued the author of what Pi sounds like. And the court held that, well, all he copied was an unprotected idea, not the way that that idea was expressed, because the rhythm and the harmony and everything was different. And I, I, I should apologize in advance for saying this, but a law professor quickly pointed out the other reason why this isn't copyright infringement, of course, is that for copyright in Pi would be irrational. Um, <laughs> and I said, I wish I'd thought of that myself, but I didn't. Uh, this is one from Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is very analogous to software development, I think. Um, an artist made a sinuous wire sculpture and hung it on a gallery and didn't sell it. 
just sat there on the gallery for a long time. And then one of the artist's friends came in one day, a bike rider, and said, you know, that sculpture of yours would make a good bike rack. <laughs> right? And, you know, most artists wouldn't take too well to that, but this was a pragmatic artist who said, you know, well, okay. So he adapted his sinuous wire sculpture into a bike rack right? and started selling them and sold them very successfully. Imitation breeds, uh, success breeds imitation. So other people started making sinuous bike racks. Our artist hadn't gotten a design patent, which would have been nice, right? Apple has design patents on its phones, which gives it a lot of protection for its design. So our artist sued for copyright infringement. Like, hey, that was a sculpture, right? That's a creative aesthetic work. He's, they're selling my sculptures right? as bike racks, but it's my sculpture. The court held, and correctly, I think, that it was an infringement because in order to, if you copied the aesthetic elements, you'd, you'd necessarily copy the protected, the unprotected functional elements, or really the other way around. In order to allow you to copy the unprotected functional elements, you have to be able to copy the creative elements. And they look at the design process. If you make the rack any different, so it looks better, is more beautiful. If you make it wider, taller, thicker, uh, skinnier pipes, that'll change the way that it works. And I think you can see the implications of that for software, right? A lot of things, if you change it just so it is more beautiful or more elegant or easier to read, it's going to change the, the function. Anybody get nostalgic looking at this? Is this ringing any bells? I mean, this is what sold the personal computer. When IBM started selling personal computers, companies, not individuals so much, but companies bought personal computers for their workforce because they wanted this program, right? Lotus uh, 1, 2, 3, a spreadsheet. Right? Word processing sold a lot of computers because it makes people more productive. But spreadsheets, are infinitely faster than people doing sums and rearranging data and everything by hand. So Lotus had a very, very, you know, the killer app that sold the PCs, which increased the demand for Lotus 1, 2, 3 spreadsheet programs. So of course, right, success breeds imitators. Borland sold its own version of Lotus 1, 2, 3. And Lotus wasn't patented. But Borland also thought, well, we want people not just to buy, it won't be enough just to say, we've got a spreadsheet that's really good. We want Lotus users to be able to migrate very easily to our product. So we'll copy, not just the way that a spreadsheet works, but we'll actually copy the exact same commands and we'll arrange them in the same hierarchy of menus, right? You have menus in those days, like men, you know, one menu would have three commands, cut, paste, delete, and then be another, they'd be arranged in a, a, a sort of a tree. <coughs> so that way, a, a, a Lotus user not only can come and use ours easily because they're familiar with it, but they can take all the macros that they have from their Lotus and they can use them right on our product. So of course, Lotus sued for infringement. Not of course, Lotus did. Uh, the, the trial court in Boston said, well, that's not infringement because, you know, they can copy creative expression and they, they, they uh, that's what they copied. Uh, uh, the, uh, that is infringement, sorry, <laughs> because they copied creative expression, right? The functionality is basically the way that the spreadsheet works. But there's many, many ways to Im implement that. And they copy not just the way that it works, but the specific creative implementation. For example, you know, they, they quit, you could say exit. Or print, you could say output. Or copy, the court said, you could say, well, they could have said clone, or ditto, or duplicate, or mimic, or imitate, or reproduce, or replicate. So the trial court said that it was infringement. Went up to the uh, appellate court. The appellate court held it's not infringement. You know, that's the user interface. That's the way that it works. That's like the steering wheel on a car. 
So it's a method of operation which is functional. So the trial, the appellate court held two to one that it wasn't copyright infringement. It went up to the Supreme Court, which got everybody excited. So, you know, finally, since 1879, we've been waiting for a case on software copyright. And what did the Supreme Court do? They split four to four. Right? So in 1996, this is the edge of copyright protection, right? Four federal judges held it's not four, six federal judges held that it wasn't protected. Six federal judges held that it was protected. So we fast forward now to 2013. What about the APIs in uh, Java, right? The trial court here in Northern California held that they weren't protected by copyright. And if looking at the, the lower court cases between 1996 and 2013, I think that that's the right decision. Um, so let's assume that the lower court is going to be upheld. That's a big shift in, in copyright law, right? From APIs being sort of the boundary of protection to now being uh, clearly unprotected, if the Google decision holds up. Well, what explains that? It's not a development, really, I think, in case law. Right? I think it's a development more attributable to projects like Python. And if you think of the parties back in 1996, and you know, com successful commercial software companies in 1996 tended to be like Lotus and Borland. Right? They relied on proprietary software, and courts were anxious that if people could copy freely, that there'd be no incentive to produce software. Right? And I think that that's been rebutted in part by things like the open source software movement that shows that you can be extremely successful in software even if people are free to copy from each other. Rather, what copyright now serves to do is prevent you from copying, literal copying of the line-for-line -line code or the executables, of course, if you're just downloading, uh, passing around, you know, pirated copies of Windows. So copyright, I think, has descended to a much lower level of protection, and I think, I think uh, that that's because software now is viewed differently uh, in large part because of the open source software movement. Um, in terms of practi practical advice, you know, I'm not going to offer a lot of practical advice, just that unless you're copying very literally, you're probably not infringing. But, of course, there are lots of situations where you might want to be copying very literally. When are you infringing? You know, that one, I think, is, is, is the thing that Google doesn't resolve. It's still a very fuzzy line. It's just been pushed down lower. Right? In Boston, somebody suggested, well, maybe if you change the variable names, maybe that would mean, you know, they're the creative part. You know, nobody knows what the creative part is and what the functional part is. So that, I'm afraid, is still a little fuzzy. Uh, but what, one thing that it's positive, another thing that's positive, of course, is for open source projects like Wine. Maybe some people here use Wine that actually allow you to implement. You can run a Windows program on Linux or Mac using Wine because Wine, the Wine project, not exactly emulates, but takes the Windows APIs and translates them into something that can run on on that system. So Wine. Microsoft has never said anything about whether wine, not wine is fringes or not, but they never sued wine. Assuming that Google holds up, but right, if, if the Google APIs are not, if the Java APIs weren't infringed by Google, then I think it would be hard to argue that the wine project infringes Microsoft. Which maybe is why Microsoft has filed a friend of the court brief. There's an appeal in uh, Oracle versus Google. And Microsoft has filed a friend of the court brief saying that it would destabilize the software industry if APIs were not protected by, uh, by copyright. And the ironic part, of course, that Microsoft does quite a bit of copying itself, as a lot of uh, little startups have found out. Uh, now I want to briefly talk a little bit about software patents. Patents are much more scary, really, for a software developer. The biggest difference being that patents you can infringe without knowing it. All right? Copyright, you can't infringe a copyright without copying. 
if I write a program, if it's very, very close to some program that somebody else independently wrote, I can't infringe their copyright unless I copied from them. Patents, of course, independent creation is not a defense. Right? Somebody can have a patent you don't even know about and you can infringe it. Now, what does this have to do with software patents? It just demonstrates that, as we all know, search is difficult, right? I, I searched for the picture, the dancing statuette in Mazer, and Google said, well, that look, to me looks like, and you recognize any of these people? Uh, Fritz Mondale, former vice president, Chairman Mao is second from left on the bottom row, and ironically enough, uh, second from the left on the top row is Ada Lovelace, the first computer programmer ever, right? It's actually not a bad search result, because right, people are usually searching for people. Right? No, who, nobody ever searches for a dancing statuette. So Google probably, statistically, gave me a relatively good result, because I'm one of the few people who are searching for a dancing statuette. So the basic point is search is hard. Right? ELS files a patent in 1994 for an interactive web browser, or a web browser that can automatically activate embedded programs. They filed that in 1994, but more than a year before that, a web browser with those capabilities had been demonstrated by a grad student at Berkeley to some people at Sun. So Eolus's browser wasn't patentable, but how's the patent office gonna know that? Right? When a patent is filed, application, it goes to an examiner, and that one examiner is supposed to look at that ELS browser application and say, has anybody ever on the face of the earth published or publicly used this? Right? That one person sitting in the patent office is supposed to search the world. And of course, the patent office didn't know that the browser, a browser with those capabilities had already been subject to a small but public demonstration. How does, this, how does open source affect this? Well, if this had been 2013, if somebody had developed a browser and was showing it to people, if it was an open source project, he or she might have put it up someplace. Right? Prior art in software is dramatically, there's a lot, lot more of it to invalidate patents now because a lot, lot more of it is publicly available. So it makes it more difficult for pat things to get patented that shouldn't be. Uh, I'll note also that in terms of searching for patents, that's difficult to do with software patents because you can use lots of different words to describe software. Uh, there's a very interesting talk from PyCon 2011 about a patent search tool using natural language programming and graph theory uh, that you can see online from PyCon 2011, a very, very nice uh, tool. So one thing open source has done is put a lot more prior art out there, stuff that might invalidate patents, which is falling in a, in a, in a good tradition. I don't know if anybody, if those are uh, sharp enough for anybody to recognize, but that's von Neumann, right, who had the famous paper that described the architecture that's used in a lot of computers, most computers. Uh, still, they had, so when they were developing one of the first electronic general purpose computers, they had to figure out, should we patent this or not? A lot of back and forth about that. They decided not to. And they took von Neumann's paper and they sent it to the patent office. So nobody else would patent it. That is a, the tradition, I think, that continues with open source, disclosing things to the world and uh, therefore keeping them in the public domain. This is the other aspect of software patents. Well, whatever happened to that ELS patent? Because that non-patent prior art, right? There was, it wasn't patented. Uh, people didn't know about the Viola browser at the time the patent was issued. Uh, last year, a jury, not this jury, but a jury, in the Eastern District of Texas invalidated the ELS patent on a browser that could embed programs. And they did that because the community had come forward and given the prior art to invalidate it. Uh, that's my time, so I'll stop there, but thanks for coming and thanks for your attention. <laughs> and if you have any questions, uh, we're happy to take questions.
Yeah, this, this, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a little off topic, but you, you mentioned uh, Apple's design patents at, at one point, and uh, some of the stuff that's, you know, as a lay person reading the, the press and so on seems really off the wall with what Apple is claiming patents on. Do you have any opinion or comment about yes, that? Yes, I, mean, I think that's extremely interesting. Design patents were a complete backwater. People, not too many people use design patents. The last Supreme Court case involving design patents was about spoons from like 1850, I think. But as you said, the one big company that really used design patents was Apple, right? You hear about all the patents that Steve Jobs had. They're mostly design patents, maybe all design patents. The thing is, it's very, very difficult to look at one design and then look at another design and see you know, are they close enough to infringe? So here in the US, Apple has successfully sued Samsung on its design patents. In the United Kingdom, exactly the same products, the court said, ah, oh, no, they aren't close enough to infringe. And they gave Apple kind of a backhanded compliment. They said, well, the, the Samsung product, that's just not as, I don't know what it is, but it's just not as cool. So therefore, it doesn't infringe. So it's <laughs> sort of, well, you know, giving them a pat on the back, but saying you lose. So I agree. It's, and the courts have, there just haven't been any design patent cases. So hopefully, the, the courts will keep narrow protection. Because otherwise, the idea that, you know, as you said, some of those Apple things, you could read them to apply to anything. Thanks. So in terms of the Google decision, the Google Oracle decision, if APIs are not copyrightable, does that threaten the uh, GPL in terms of the GPLs? If you link to us or you use our APIs, uh, you, are, you have to make your thing GPL too? That, that's a very, very good question. Um, <coughs> and which is one ironic thing about the GPL. Right, and the, the GPL, which is a great, great project and a great, great document, but it does rely on a relatively restrictive software license, right, in comparison to the, like Python license just says, here's some software, do whatever you want as long as you give us an attribution. Or as the GPL says, here's some software, you can use it, but if you adapt it, you gotta make it available and has other restrictions. Um, and in terms of them being able to go out and prevent other people from linking to it or prevent other people from using their APIs, I would think yes, because it, there's, there, and there's sort of two things there. If somebody uses the software, then you can get more protection, right? If they, if they do something where they actively assent to the GPL, then they can say, well, it doesn't matter if we're infringing your copyright or not. You agree to the license. But in terms of using your APIs to prevent other people from doing things that you don't like, I think that it does restrict the, the ability of all software copyright holders to control what others do if they're not copying your code. So that's a very general answer, but I think that's a very good question. Hi. Hi. So I, in my wildest dreams, I would, um, so I do EEG data analysis, or I'm running an experiment like that now, and I'm using Python to analyze data. The data that I'm analyzing is actually the output of uh, software for which my school has paid in tens of thousands of dollars to license. <laughs> um, the idea being that you just get voltage from each electrode site, and then you have fancy algorithms in this software for analyzing whether, you know, the voltage change that you saw was an artifact or something. So there are, say, four algorithms that built into that software. And if I were to try to build a Python analog open source for this, but I know that the algorithms that electrophysiolo electrophysiologists want to use are these four, when I, would whatever I build be at risk for infringement if I'm using these algorithms, even though I think those algorithms were originally designed by scientists before software like this. Um, do you have any insight into that? Or? Yeah, and I'll just say in general terms, because obviously I don't know your particular case, but the three things I think about usually are, well, copyright, if you're just copying the way that something works, in general, copyright isn't a problem. So copying an algorithm in general isn't copyright infringement. Uh, the other possibility is patent infringement. And anybody who writes any software is infringing probably hundreds of patents. So 
why worry, right? But, uh, that in the, but I, I say that ironically, but it's also kind of true. Even if it wasn't the public domain, there may be a patent that shouldn't have been issued that has been issued that covers it. The other possibility is the license. You kind of have to look at the license. You maybe have agreed to something under the terms of the school's license that restricts what you can do. That's all the time we had. Please uh, give Steve a warm round of applause. Okay, thank you. Thank you.